Thank you. Ah, Mike is working. Good. And let's see. Oopsie. Okay. Um, just get to the beginning, right? Okay. Uh, give you a chance to uh, photograph the uh, QR for the slides. And the slides have links to quite a few books, free books. So that's one reason you're going to want those slides to get the free books. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so here we go. Uh, I, uh, I, I knew I'd see some nice mountains and lakes out there, but I come from Norway and we have some nice mountains and lakes too. You might have a mountain lake. But uh, I think your water is a lot warmer than our water. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, but it's uh, it's lovely here. But this is where I would be today if I wasn't here. This is my summer cabin on the Oslo Fjord. And it, it just has this fantastic view of the fjord and the islands and uh, not so many high mountains because we're near Oslo and that's the low mountain area. You know, so I thought I'd share that with you. Uh, I was asked, uh, like most people here, to say something about the theme of uh, the V-model. And I don't have a very good relationship with the V-model, but I'll, I'll say some things about it anyway. And then I'll move on to things that I think are uh, more advanced ways of dealing with that problem. Let's put it that way. So this is, just very quickly, roughly what I'm going to try to get through. If you, you can ignore that and just wait until it hits. Here's a typical V model uh, with its waterfall roots. And uh, of course, many have realized that we can go through a V model rather quickly. And then we have something called agile or iterative or, or something like that. So I'm interested in what I call shift left. And that means placing uh, less emphasis on the uh, right hand side and uh, doing a lot more new and different things on the left-hand side. So I'll explain what that uh, means. For example, uh, uh, I place great emphasis on very uh, rigorous requirement specification. I'll get into what I mean by that, but much more rigorous than anything I have seen. And I've been to all the requirement sessions this morning and things like that. Okay, so rigorous requirements, okay? Then I believe in rigorous quality control of the requirements to a standard. And I'll show you examples of, for example, uh, one client of mine, Intel, doing that in a very interesting way. Now, the point is this. Everybody knows that one of the major sources of problems in systems is that the upstream requirements were badly done, badly quality controlled, and are full of defects. So the defects get into the architecture, and they get into the system, and they get into the testing, and everything's a mess. You think that's not going to get knocked down on the floor? Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm a thank you, David. I'm, I, I'm a fanatic at risk avoidance. And that looks like a hell of a risk to me. Here you go, Tom. Business. Okay. Okay, so uh, I, I, I believe that people neither know how to write requirements clearly. I see no evidence of it here today, by the way, no examples. Maybe there are some. How many people say, Tom, uh, I, we or I write requirements very well, very rigorously? Not a lot of hands. Okay, with the, we know where we are. I know where you are. Okay. And uh, But rigorously writing the requirements means that they have a high quality uh, in various dimensions, and they're less likely to cause you problems later on the uh, right-hand side of the V. Okay? So this is, a, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. By the way, 16 ounces to the pound for you metrics people. Okay? It's, uh, we know it is smart to do good work up front to save bad problems downstream, but we don't, we don't even talk about it at this conference, was my observation from this morning with the V models, okay? And then 
one thing is writing requirements in a rigorous, rich uh, manner, but another thing is quality controlling them. Because, you know, when an engineer writes a page of requirements, they and we check them against a simple standard, like it should be unambiguous and clear to the intended readership, like the architect, the tester. You know how many defects there are per 100 words? About at least 25 or 30 of the words are unintelligible, ambiguous, and not suited for going to an architect or a tester or anybody else. Okay, You can measure how bad they are, and you can use that measurement to drive down the defects to what we'll see in a slide coming up from Intel. They drive the defects down to 0 0.2 per 600 words. Where are you? You're probably at 2,550 for 600 words, okay? And you don't even know it because you don't even measure it, okay? Now, we'll get there when we get there. So um, I don't believe we can eliminate various forms of testing, but maybe we can reduce the cost of doing it by a factor of 100 to 1. I could have said bigger numbers, but you wouldn't believe me. And reduce the cost of fixing things, which is a horrible cost by 100 to 1, okay? And you get paybacks of 100 to 1 or something like that for doing work up front. Okay, so shift left. Uh, but there's one other thing I didn't uh, mention here. There are, um, there are things we call defect prevention processes, DPP. Was a term was invented by IBM, who did this in their labs. And I'll talk a little bit more about them, but basically defect prevention processes are constantly looking at thousands of engineers working and trying to improve their processes in many small ways, like 3000 different ways in two years at IBM's labs in Minnesota. Okay, and when you have prevented the defect happening, it doesn't happen the next hundred times it would have happened. And you don't have to find it in testing. Okay, and I, I've heard really nothing about defect prevention ideas. So there's defect prevention. Uh, make sure you have a process that prevents the defects from occurring in, for example, requirements or architecture. And then you have uh, defect detection at early stages in the requirements, not, for example, the code. Wrong place. Really stupid. Stupidest thing I ever thought about is, is code testing, which is incredibly ineffective. I mean, you're lucky if you get half of the bugs. Okay, the other half simply remains no matter what effort you spend. That's crazy. But that's what we do. Here's a little uh, re reminder of uh, the, the uh, reduction in costs you get when you invest early. That's really all this diagrams trying to say. Um, a very interesting uh, person uh, out there, he claims to be the real inventor of Lean Startup, for those who know that. Uh, um, but uh, Steve, Steve Blank is, is also at Stanford and does a lot of work these days for the US military. And I, th I thought I'd give you a link to him. You can get a, steveblank.com gets you a wonderful weekly newsletter, which is the only one I bother to read. It's amazing the depth and content that Steve Blank has. So I recommend you try out his free blog. But um, he he's also in, heavily involved with a major effort in systems engineering for the US military. And here, here it is, the, the legacy systems are, are the old systems and then the where we need to be is a very interesting list of pivots and changes. You know, not one change, not one, one size fits all, but uh, 20 major pivots or changes in which probably apply to all in systems engineering, I'm guessing, okay? Because that's what this is. But you might like to follow up uh, Steve Blank. Here's a, another guy. He uh, worked a lot at, uh, with uh, Software Engineering Institute and CMM, and then he did a doctoral thesis, but he was very, very good at stakeholder stuff. And he very, very serious about uh, doing requirements really well. So I put his slide up and said, well, 
Uh, I'm going to talk to you about my method for writing requirements in design called language. So we'll say we know how to do that. And uh, uh, I last year, I finally did my, my an ambition I've had for several years. I wrote a book called Stakeholder Engineering. Free copy right there. About, I think it's 170 pages, I forget. I'm very proud of it. If you want to go deep into stakeholder, try look at that book. Uh, here's another guy. He, he, he was most fascinating, uh, Brian Gallagher, for starting at the end and working his way towards the beginning, sort of opposite direction thinking. And that, uh, that alone, I thought, was just an interesting approach, working your way backwards from the result. But it's actually pretty close to what I believe we need to do, too. Oh, and here's some military stuff uh, showing that they understand uh, you know, small iterations. They're not stuck in waterfall model. Well, now I've done my talk on the model, and we can all go get some more ice cream or something. Anyway, now I talk about what I really like to talk about uh, in my own methods. So uh, I'm going to talk about requirements, design, and a, a form of um, review or inspection called specification quality control. And they're all in this book. And if you go to Amazon or something, they'll probably charge you $60. I'll give you a special discount, 100%. So you can get a free copy of it. You'll find it in the slides, uh, later slides and stuff. But, uh, so it's about the 500 page book. It defines my planning language, my way of doing requirements properly. So if you say, Tom, what do you mean by doing requirements properly? I said, download my free book, it's in the book. That's the simple answer. And then you can show me what you have, if you think you have something better. So I'll make you a bet. You don't even think you have something better, erroneously. Huh? Arrogant, huh? Go on, challenge me. Challenge me. Um, I have had uh, some good friends who spent most of their lives arguing about which agile method was the good one. And uh, uh, so Ivar Jakobsen of URL team, uh, has uh, called out, we must end the wars of Agile, the methods wars. And so he has formed a thing called Essence. Actually, we formed it here uh, in, in, at ETH in Zurich some years ago, really started the action there, the Semat and then Essence. I have donated um, uh, all of my methods to Essence to be distributed for free forever to everybody. And so have several other methods. We decided stop the wars, uh, make the methods free, and people will pick, you will pick the methods that suit you, that work for you. End of discussion. No licenses, no special training courses, no certifications, just a, a, a library, really, of methods that uh, maybe if I give, uh, I've given about 100 distinct methods, maybe you only want five of mine and five of somebody else's. And the thing is, you'll try them out and they work for you and you say, good, let's keep them. Anyway, my agile friends, uh, I said, you guys have got to stop fighting each other, these agile wars. And they said, no, no, but our agile method is better or our agile method is more agile. Or, and I thought, it's, it's such a loss of energy. I mean, you're, you're not fighting methods, you're fighting people who are earning money from, for certification. <laughs> you know, so there is no logical argument. So, uh, and they said, what do you mean, stop? What, what, what else can we do? I said, a really big pivot. What's that? I said, don't worry about the method at all. Go to a higher level. What's that, Tom? Well, what do we all want? What do you want? You want success in your project. You want to avoid failure in your project. Let's see, how many people would think success in the project was a good idea? Let's, let's see some hands. Right, how many people would think avoiding embarrassing failure would be a good idea? Good, you came to the right place. That link there, on the right-hand side, I wrote a whole book for that one friend of mine. I dedicated it to him. And I said, Al, this is where we need to go. Forget Agile, forget model-based this, forget the models. Raise your sights. Focus on successful 
technology projects, systems engineering, focus on avoiding failure of which there is far too much, ridiculous, especially in software, but other places. And so I wrote a book. I had to do interesting things like define what success means. See? Do you think I have the same definition that you do? I doubt it. Uh -huh. But there's a little hint here. These extremely clearly defined requirements, they define success. And not meeting them defines failure. That was the simple version. But it's trickier than that. You are successful when you reach the requirements in the future that you would want to have in the future, even if you didn't have them when you began. That's a deep thought. Yeah. And I've written this all down and showed how it works in the book. So if you maybe just uh, saw enough hands that sort of wanted success, uh, free book, share it with your friends. No, but don't share it with your enemies. So I used to hold a lot of courses in London and, and Russians would pop up on the courses. And I said, here my materials, but not with Vladimir Putin. Oh, yeah. One of them tried to convince me that Vladimir was a really nice guy, at least better than Stalin. I don't know. So, um, okay. Um, uh, uh, here's another, uh, 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 yeah, here's, the, here's the link to the book. The, this is basically the standard for my methods, the standard for language and specification, quality control and evolutionary delivery. And by standard, I mean 700 well-defined terms, uh, everything written as a process standard with principles and rules and examples is a standard. Okay, so you, and by the way, it's free. You can have it, you can adopt it, you can change it, I don't care. Okay, but uh, this should be a, maybe a baseline. You should not do worse than this. And I hope you can do better. And then stand here next year and care what you did better. Okay, so um, here's a little bit of what's uh, in the, uh, the book. But for example, uh, one thing I'm fanatic on is quantification of variables. Now, what's, what are variables? Well, all qualities are variables. Usability, security, safety, they're variables. It's amazing how many people have requirements for things like that, and they have not quantified. It just says we're going to have the best safety systems in the world using method X. They actually throw in the design without having defined the requirement. That's quite normal. Incredible that people went to university and didn't learn something more rigorous than that, like having the real requirement and keeping the design a little bit separate until you evaluate it later. Okay, anyway, this is, if you like, a list, again, as I go through that, uh, fine. But on Friday, I held a course and six people in this room were on the course and I spent a whole day explaining just the requirements and, dis and designs. So obviously I can't do more than hand you the book and maybe get you interested Okay, so here's just a way of looking at it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very driven by what I call values, which is short for stakeholder values. I found a very good consciousness here about stakeholders, but that's normal in systems engineering. And, um, but the, the values idea, now people are talking a lot about values and value streams, but you go a little bit deeper, what do you mean by value? And they get answers like, oh, how much money you made in profit? Huh. I'm working for United Nations trying to save lives. What's that got to do with it? Isn't saving life a better value than earning money at the UN? Okay. I mean, people don't even have a clear idea of what values are, let alone a good way of formulating them at the start of a project. By the way, I've uh, written a little booklet. You'll find at least at the end, I have uh, all the links to all the books, the end of the slides. But I, I took a look at United Nations sustainability planning, the, with its 17 uh, things like hunger and education, and I found that they were bullshit from one end to the other, nice sounding words that only politicians can say aloud. 
no clear ideas at all that we're planning to save the world here. That's a pretty serious systems engineering project, if you ask me. No clear. So I wrote a whole book by uh, analyzing this in detail. Why is it unclear? And then showing how it could be clearer. So if you're doing any charity work or good work and want to learn how to systems engineer saving the world, get a copy of my sustainability uh, planning book. By the way, if, if, if you get lost in all these uh, free books I'm giving away, <laughs> that one, they're at the end, the slides. And if you email me, is that forgotten everything, but I, you had something about United Nations and I can't find. So just email me. I'll probably today, latest tomorrow, send you a, a link to the copies, make it easy for you. Um, another thing I, I, I believe in, uh, knowing that these values need to be multiple simultaneously, also multiplicity, I hear too little about that, okay? People are very one-track mind, you know, one thing, like quality, and by, what do you mean by that? Well, no bugs in the code, that's it. That's the whole of quality. What about safety? Uh, yeah, we want very safe cars. Okay, so we need to we need to look at things in multiple dimensions simultaneously. Do you? Have you got the top ten critical qualities for your system, and have you quantified them all so they're clear? How many people say, "Yep, Tom, we do the top ten critical values or qualities, and we quantify them"? Let's see. Where's the state of maturity in Switzerland? What country are you from, sir? No, so I didn't get anybody from Switzerland to volunteer. <laughs> hmm. Okay, we should probably talk. Okay, you must be the most mature guy in the audience, professionally. Okay. Now, from this managility, uh, managility is really uh, very large scale systems engineering agility talk. There, there was a, this is a set of slides, and it's uh, down there at the bottom. Uh, you might be interested, but um, I thought I'd show one example. Uh, so uh, here I have a thing that uh, is called an impact estimation table. So you can see it's a table. Um, uh, now, uh, the prin principle, uh, and by the way, there's a whole book just on this called the value uh, impact estimation table, but it's in the competitive engineering book too. Now, uh, I've taken an example small enough to uh, get into a slide. Uh, so, but, so normally we would have order of magnitude, the top 10 values. Here, there are only four that should fit in, okay? But normally, now, by the way, top 10, what if you have 20 values? Well, I say prioritize the top 10 and do them. That's a miracle. Then when you're done, look at the other 10. That's a dynamic prioritization idea. Okay. Yeah. So um, you'll notice uh, there are two numbers here. Uh, it says status and width. Uh, basically, that's status is where we are in our current system, and width is where we want to be in some future to be better. Okay, so it's a degree of improvement idea. And there is a defined scale of measure, which I'm, a little hint of it is, is here, but this is very abbreviated. Anyway, we have four dis defined targets for this. Then we have uh, a number of uh, strategies, also known as designs, also known as architecture, okay? Also known as solutions, okay? And, and they, they have a name. And here, we try to say, ask a very simple question, the new legislation strategy, how much of movement in our consumer costs will we make if we implement it? So in other words, how effective is the design? Have you asked questions about how effective the design is in 10 dimensions simultaneously? That would be systems engineering. Okay, and the answer here, simplify, is 70%. 
What does that mean? I mean, well, that's a pretty good design, but it's not good enough. We're still lacking 30%. So we either have to replace this design with a more effective one or add complementary designs so we get to 100%, so we reach our goal. But then we ask, uh, we say, uh, that, that's good, but what about new legislation and my requirement number two? Now, actually what it says is question mark and zero. This is known as a known unknown. How did I do that? Oh, it. So we, uh, now, uh, actually most things we don't know very much about. And we're very uncertain about what we think we know, but some things we don't know at all, but we don't know that we don't know them. Therefore, they are little hidden traps to surprise us later. What if the answer here were it was the result was minus 200%? A negative side effect. Now, good engineers look for side effects systematically. Do you? Or do you ignore them? Do you have a tool for looking at them like this? For realizing that nobody has any idea, at least none that they've documented and shared with everybody, for the effect there or there or there. Gee, very dodgy. Okay. Um, now, uh, down below the values, we have uh, one or a set of uh, resources. And these are things like money, time, people, and technical debt. In other words, future costs for maintaining the system, resources. And I believe that when you're looking at a design, you ought to ask what the costs are in all critical dimensions, not just the capital cost. We have, we have a, an idea that there are life cycle costs, but I, I didn't hear anything about it in any lecture I attended this morning. Put it that way, this uh, absent. But here we plug them in and then uh, we look at the costs and we can actually compute the values to costs ratio, roughly, and get some idea of the cost effectiveness of any design, any strategy, any architecture. We can do this in any systems engineering uh, project. So um, here's a list of all the wonderful things this tool can do. The tool can be put on any table or spreadsheet. It's absolutely free. But, uh, and I think any major project you do ought to have at least one such table that relates the multiple requirements to the multiple architecture and uh, uh, gives you some idea of how good things are. By the way, when we make estimates, we have a rigor which includes giving the evidence and the source and the, the uncertainty range for everything there. We don't just throw in nice sounding numbers. Okay. Okay. Um, here's a little book I wrote on clear communication. We were having a little talk uh, yesterday over the dinner and, and agreed very early on that uh, everybody, the, the big problem is lack of clarity, right? And you all know this, but so I, I took the trouble to write a whole book on com clearer communication, all the tools I have there. And, but it is, in, you know, this table can be an example of a clearer communication about a complex systems engineering project. By the way, the table can be can mirror the uh, infinitely large systems through hierarchies of related tables. It's not just one table. In other words, we can do big, large-scale systems engineering. I mentioned Intel. Now, uh, Intel started using my methods about 1997 or eight. Uh, by 2016, they had trained over 20,000 Intel engineers on a two-day course in language so they could write clear specifications for Intel chips and the quality of Intel chips. They use it for all their flagship products. John Terzakis in Boston uh, worked on projects at Intel using my methods, but he did something else, which uh, he did research but he's not an academic, he's not a professor, but he did some really interesting practical research and uh, published it. Sorry, I accidentally hit, I'm going back. 
uh, the, the, uh, the link is, is there on, on the left. But let me just tell the, the short story of what's going on here. Um, the um, uh, engineers for a project uh, delivered requirements 31 pages. Okay, fine. Uh, they, they used, uh, these were delivered in language. So in fact, we know from previous measures that if you use language as a strict, disciplined, clear language, the defects, the unintelligible stuff goes down by about one order of magnitude. It just is clearer with a number 26 rather than extremely. To long, make a long story short. So they already, uh, uh, just by using language, they're sort of forced to be clear, but there's still a lot of complexity there. And so they, they run a specification quality control uh, on it, according to my method, looking for, again, simplifying, looking for unclear things that might confuse any other engineer. And they count them up and they found 312 defects in total. So that's about 10 per page, right? By the way, a page here is 600 words. Actually, 10 faults per 600 words is incredibly clean. Okay, if I were to perform this test on your requirements, I would bet in advance I'd find between 100 and 300. I've made many such bets. Nobody ever pays me money, but I'm usually pretty right. You can try. I'm just count ambiguous words in your requirements and you'll, you'll re realize that's, that's it. Anyway, now it, it turns out that that level of defects is uh, something that Intel has economically said is not on. If we let that go on, we will produce chips in the billions distributed across the world and have to recall them and the company will go bankrupt. So they're extremely conscious, quality conscious. They can't just upgrade the watch or the test level of software. It's pretty hard logic, okay? They've actually learned that in order to survive, they cannot have more than this number down here, about 0 0.2 defects per page of 600 words. That's like incredibly clean, okay? So basically they say, hey, you guys are 50 times worse than our exit standard from this requirements process. So you cannot exit. This is not going to go to the architect or anybody else. Okay, and so the team tries again, and they actually get twice as good, and then still twenty-five times worse than it should be. So they keep on trying, and they're producing almost whole new documents, maybe to do this. They do whatever they need to do, and finally, a forty-five page requirement has only ten defects, zero point two, and uh, they grant a uh, formal numeric exit based on the quality of the requirements and based on uh, the quality is based on the standards for how to write requirements, which there's a written list. You'll find lots of, these are called rules and you'll find examples of them in the competitive engineering book and Intel more or less adopted the rules I had in the, the book there. So uh, here's some statements. Productivity of the teams doing this was 233% higher. Okay, the other numbers I've given you. Uh, I think this is a nice, cheap way of getting 100 times better. Right, they did. Yeah. By the way, I didn't go into Intel, knock on the door and say, may I sell you my methods? They're so smart, they came to me. I said, Tom, your methods smell interesting. Can we try them? See? Smart companies go to conferences like this and look for good ideas. Okay? Not so smart companies wait until the salesman's knocking on the door with a second rate product and let themselves be convinced to buy it. Okay? Let me check. 10 more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I, I did uh, years of work at uh, first McDonnell Douglas Aviation, now part of Boeing, and later, because that was so successful, uh, at Boeing. And uh, the main thing we did, we did there was to do um, the um, uh, specification quality control method on engineering drawings. And they told me that that had never happened before. They, there was no record of... of 
they had a thing called checking of the engineering drawings, which sounds like they're doing it, but this rigorous check against the rule and numbers and counting, extrapolations and exit, they had not been doing. In fact, I'm surprised none of you, uh, they released the drawings uh, on the dog date, the due out of group date, no matter how bad they were. This resulted in aircraft being seriously delayed. In fact, I believe Swiss Air sued them for $10 million because of delayed aircraft. Okay, so they sort of had quality control, but it was so weak that it wasn't really working. We used my specification quality control method, same one as at Intel, on all engineering drawings. And uh, we, uh, within a few months, it was, they measured very carefully how successful it was in getting really clean uh, drawings. And then they uh, spread it to, I think there were about 3000 engineers at McDonnell Douglas. So that within uh, four or five months, uh, everybody was doing it and was trained. It was a very rapid uh, digital transformation or something like that. Okay. And uh, uh, they, they also then bragged about it to Big Brother Boeing, who, who uh, also adopted it uh, as successfully. So uh, now here, here's one of the engineers, really called Gary, who said, here's what happened to me. It's, it's the same story as with Intel. I submitted a drawing. I've been doing it for years. I'm a senior engineer. And normally it would be approved. But uh, it had 80 defects per page of the drawing. Okay, so no exit. So I tried again, and hey, I'm twice as good. <laughs> the, the standard for release is less than one defect per page. So this is 40 times, even this improvement is 40 times worse than they need. So no exit. So I tried again. 23, getting better, learning. He's, he's actually being motivated to learn the engineering standards for aircraft design, which has been there, but it was a big, sick book. Nobody had a copy. It was down the corridor. They didn't have time to train enough people because they had a massive influx of, of people. And so nobody knew what the standards were. So this became the way they were actually learning their own standards. And you know, the, the previous generation had spent since Second World War, I guess, learning you know, over the years, the standards, but they had, when they, when they suddenly got 2000 new engineers, they, they couldn't train them anymore. Uh, here's what the top managers said about this inspection, like uh, world's best practical training course. You get very focused on exactly what you do wrong and, and make it right, okay? So that's pretty good because I'm not an aircraft engineer. I actually said, this is stuff we do in software that we learned from IBM. Maybe it'll work on aircraft drawings, which are not hardware. An aircraft drawing is soft. And they said, give it a try. We gave it a try, and it worked better than anything they had. Strange, strange ideas. Uh, by the way, I didn't knock on their door and try to sell them anything. They found me. And they found these ideas. They had uh, all the good organizations. They have what I call champions or spies who go out to conferences like this. So some of you are maybe of that nature looking for ideas that will work better. So I hope that's why you're here. And I hope I can give you something to go uh, home with. Let's see, I'm gonna skip as I, uh, here, I, I, I mentioned the uh, defect prevention process, the idea that we do something at the earliest stages of at least you know, requirements and, and architecture, and, but, but going down into test uh, planning and, and coding of software and things like that. And uh, the, the idea is that we find root causes of why things didn't, uh, why defects occurred, and we remove the root cause in the organization. So the next 1,000 times that root cause got triggered, nothing bad happened. Now, that's a lot smarter than removing one of the thousands and leaving 999 things to be fixed later. Okay, so I'd like to focus your attention, but it has a name, there are books on it, but I also discovered that my good friend Elon does this with a vengeance. He tells his teams at Tesla and SpaceX, every day I want you to think about two things when you're doing your work. Number one, can we improve the product in any way? If yes, do it now, today. 
you have the money and the power. Amazing. And by the way, your work process, if you can think of any improvement at all, do it now as a team. Make it work. You have the money and the power. Daily numeric improvement of process and product supported by the power to make the change at the local team level. That's what Musk does. Okay. Now, I started about a year ago collecting things from videos and other places because Musk hasn't written his software engineering handbook yet, maybe in his old age. But I've been collecting what he says on videos and things like that. And so if you want my Musk's Methods book, currently about 80, 90 pages, uh, there it is. We'll show a small sample of them before I have to leave the stage, I think, work it in. Uh, there's a little map of the uh, Raytheon using the defect prevention process. And there is uh, one of my uh, books where we had a chapter on it. Uh, how it works is very simple. You empower people to look at their current work and, and uh, defects that they've encountered and ask the simple root cause question, and then to experiment by changing something so that root cause doesn't kick in and cause defects. And if so, spread it to the whole organization, X thousand engineers. Okay, so here is uh, Raytheon actually doing it. Uh, that's the rework they had one year, 43%. Of uh, uh, all cost was rework, and they uh, using among other things the defect prevention process. They drove it down by a factor of ten to five percent. Wouldn't you like to get ten times better in engineering productivity? Study the Raytheon case, which we have uh, links to, by the way. Okay, here's. Um, IBM using the defect prevention process. And uh, long story short, over a two year period, they were able to, uh, uh, within the first year, get rid of um, uh, about 50% of all defects or problems. This didn't happen. And then another two years or so, 70%. And at the extreme in some labs, uh, they they uh, got you know 99.9 .9 type levels of reducing defects that otherwise would happen if they hadn't done the defect prevention process, and they were doing things like changing 3,000 small things, like the training course slides that had misinformed engineers about what to do, you know no big thing like buy method X once, you know, but, but the little practical things that really caused engineers to do bad stuff. They removed them from the system and had the power to do it. Uh, so let's see, probably about five minutes or less. What do you, five minutes. Okay, so I have to, oh. Um, so here's the Musk's Methods book. It started off a little tour he did about a year ago where on uh, there's his rockets in the, the back ground. Now, uh, during that tour, he orally wrote his methods systems engineering handbook. There it is, one page, very simple. Okay, take a look at the first one. It's uh, quite amazing. Assume that the requirements are wrong or bad, or at least can be improved, no matter who wrote them, like Elon Musk. No matter how intelligent that person who wrote them is, like Elon Musk. <laughs> In other words, he's telling them as, as the boss, have no fear. I want you to, to rip apart my bad requirements ideas and get them better. And I want you to do that at all times continuously every time you go to work on them. There's no stage called the requirements and approved requirements. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely continuous you know, uh, while they're working and, and going through their cycles of building better rockets and, and Teslas for that matter. He says, the same thing is true for design. All designs are wrong. It's just a matter of how wrong. It's a wonderfully profound thought when you're doing design. <laughs> and there's some other good advice here. And, and by the way, Elon didn't always take his advice. Uh, many of you will know about his attempt to automate the Model 3 uh, production in, in uh, 
California. And that was a disaster, right? What he did was he did too much automation too fast. It's on the belief that automation must be a good thing. And it wasn't. He said, no, no, we have to approach automation systematically through this process in this sequence. And only when this sequence has optimized things as far as we can go, then we say, is automation appropriate here? Very interesting idea for those like Musk who once believed in total automation of the factory, no longer. Okay. Now, that's enough of that. Now, I, I couldn't resist rewriting what he said, so it was clear. But he just babbled it. And he's good at babbling, but writing it down helps. So this is Gilb's own version of uh, what he said. And I even, and this is in the Musk Methods book, uh, I even took each one of these points and wrote a whole page on it in detail. So if you want my deeper analysis of these five uh, principles, go ahead. So you know why I'm on my third Tesla now? Same reason I'm alive and I'm 81 years old. Risk adverse. How did you know that the Teslas are the safest cars on the planet by far? That's not an accident. That's Musk hiring the smartest safety designer or architect he can get and letting them loose to make it the safest car in the world. To hell with stupid California regulations. They're at this level. Go for incredible levels of safety by architecture and design. And that's how they get three cars at the head of the 50 safest cars on the planet. Interesting. That's called designing quality in, one of my favorite subjects. And now I think in practice, I better shut up, right? Three more seconds, right, okay. Well, we'll leave it there. There are more slides, and at the end of the slides, there are four pages of free links to downloads. It does require study, and you can share these with your colleagues, right? My mission in life at my age, the Indians call it seva. It's service to humanity the last fourth of your life, okay? I just want to give you some really nice ideas, and I hope you're ready to think about them. Make up your own mind. Thank you. Are we willing to answer a few questions? Yes. Okay. As always, we would um, continue with our um, with the Q and A session. I know everybody is thinking about a tremendously long reading list now, but maybe do you have questions for Tom? I'll be here until midnight. As some of you know from yesterday. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'd love to talk to people. I'll go on, throw, throw out a question. Like, am I joking? <laughs> am I serious? Do these methods really work? Hmm. Yes. So you're going to get the microphone. Uh, what about the experience from perspective of tailoring between overdoing? all this quality aspect and not doing it at all. So okay. the stomach feeling. Yeah, What's the there's there's there? several answers there. In the planning language, in the requirements, uh, we don't just have a requirement, the goal. We have a thing called a tolerable level. Now, the tolerable level is the minimum for not failing. It defines less than tolerable, intolerable, actually defines failure quite formally, OK? Now, uh, so, so the, we must at least try to get to that level or we have a formal failure, maybe even a contractual failure. This could be in the contract. Now, we have a thing called the goal. The goal is uh, the dream we think we have the technology and resources to deliver. So it's we promise that level. When the project incrementally reaches that level, we stop. That's how we avoid overdoing it. That's the simple answer. Yes, microphone's on its way. Thank you for the interesting presentation. 
My question is your method, how it can help with um, understanding the level of abstraction? Because one of the challenges I'm seeing is engineers are going too deep when too detail level or jumping in the solution when they write requirements. Good. How it can help. Yeah, them. good question. I understand it. That's what engineers do. They dive into the technology before they thought clearly about the multiple requirements. Okay. So my, my message is you have to do your multiple requirements and multiple costs first before you do any diving into any technology at all. You're just not allowed to go there. It's because if you do, you risk a technology that is good for three of the requirements and bad for seven. You've got to know what the other seven are before you take a look at any thing. Okay. The other thing is most of my methods are we call outside the black box and they're also scale free. I had some slides on it there, but I didn't get there, but uh, there's a whole book on, uh, paper on scale free. Now, uh, so the, my methods are actually looking outside the black box at the properties, no matter how complex or large the inside of the black box is. Uh, my book project right now, I'm right in the middle of it, uh, it's been about six weeks, it's called Simple. Okay, and uh, uh, in simple, I go into the theory of the black box and why my methods are scalable. And I, I never realized why my methods were scalable, but it's because I'm staying outside the black box and the horrendous complexity of, uh, is inside the black box, but we're still controlling the safety and the cost outside the black box. That's a fairly short answer, but uh, I'll, I'll send you the, the, the simple book on request. Mm, sorry, oh, Mike, come in. There is one. There is one mic. Do we have time? I have a question. Where, where are uh, hi? <laughs> yeah, another mic. I have a question in, um, with regards of atomic requirements. So, what's your take on how detailed would should uh, engineers go into specifying atomic requirements with? Re as opposed to having less requirements, but with more text in them. I'm asking this because there's some industries where they, they really break down and you have for a one instrument or one system, you have okay. two or 3,000 requirements. I mean, I'd better answer your question. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm a great fan of extremely few controlling requirements at the top. So I, I refer to the top 10. I'm serious. I've taken some very large projects, like US military projects. And on Monday, we do the top 10 and quantify them. And that's how we get control of a very large, complex system. Now, if you go a little bit deeper, you'll find that these very large number of maybe what you call atomic requirements, they're not actually requirements. They're bad designs. Time and time again, people call designs requirements, and they're not, okay? Now, that, that's, that's a short answer in a short time. Happy to discuss it more, but that's my answer. Okay, we, we do, did we have time for one more there? Yeah, hi. Thank you. It's working. Um, actually, um, I mean, uh, Every particular part of your presentation, I wanted to ask something, but maybe sure. <laughs> the most uh, question that I want to ask now. You, you buy the beers, I'll answer the questions. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice deal. <laughs> uh, your method is about shifting the V. Yes. Towards the left side. Exactly. Or, or up, and, I would prefer to say upstream, but the V. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's actually changed my experience too much because I think even we should be more balanced because it's already shifted. Okay. By the way, very, very, very short mark. I'm fanatic on balance. I think systems engineering is all about balancing the values and qualities and costs and stakeholder concerns. So, I mean, balance, yes, that's what it's all about. But you need tools like quantification and tables to see if it's out of balance and to see if you brought it back into balance. So, so balance, I would, I would, yes. I would challenge that we should go to the right. 
That's the point here. You're so uh, you're, you're, sorry, you were challenged that we should or should not go to the we right. We should go a little bit to the right. Because, should go a little bit to the right. Yes. Okay, now you're starting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that we have to define and have a much longer discussion than we have time for. Us. But I mean, the rationality behind the beer. <laughs> Let's take the last one here. Oh, sorry, last one. Okay, yeah. Hi, Tom. Hi, thanks very much. Um, oh, you're my friend from Australia, sort of. I'm from Australia, so yeah. that would be all. Philip, yeah, yeah. my grandson's name, too. Good name. Yeah. yeah. Good local name. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I agree with you 100%, but we should be shifting to the left or shifting upstream, as you said. But back to your point about balance, how do you balance that against the need of the customer or the desire of the customer that just wants to have something in their hand to play with? Okay, got a simple answer for that. Um, uh, I'm a fanatic on spending for even large, complex projects a week. Monday, quantified top 10. Tuesday, top 10 most powerful strategies. Wednesday, the impact estimation table. Thursday, decomposition. Now, the decomposition day, we ask an incredibly simple question. What of these top strategies, some small part, can we implement next week in order to improve at least one of the values? And we do that 50 weeks in a row until we've delivered everything. And that works. But this, this I call that, I call that uh, project startup method and it's well documented in my stuff. Okay, so in other words, I get rolling the next week with visible, measurable results on the new agenda. Now you have to use the old system to start off there, even though you're ultimately going to build a whole new one. Okay, but uh, you do proof that the ideas work, and and you see their cost effectiveness, and you have to be able to uh, maybe swap out a framework to get the the new hardware and software in there in time. That kind of thing. But uh, a lot of people have this strange idea, the waterfall idea that, you know, you have to spend years planning and years building. And we have systems like in Little Norway, the health system. For one patient, one journal, sounds easy. They spent eight years and eight billion kroner. And then they announced to the government, it's not done. We'll need another eight years and eight billion kroner. I've been trying to talk to these people about doing it simpler and delivering earlier, but they, they will not listen. And uh, after all, who cares? It's just taxpayers' money and no health for me. Okay, that's the short answer. I guess we're done. Okay. <laughs> yes, I think we have to close um, this keynote session. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, David.